Right then everyone, so I did try to turn the engine over to get the oil flowing round and make sure that everything's uh, nicely primed, ready for start-up. The start motor just spun and didn't turn the engine over. It turns out that I was sold the wrong starter motor. For some reason they gave me one for a Volkswagen Beetle for a 5-speed, so that's no use to me at all. I'm just going to bolt this one on now and just try and prime the engine again and turn it over to make sure that everything works. Right, I've just switched the starter motors, so now is the moment of truth. Bear in mind there's no fuel or anything else, this is just to see if a thing will turn over now. And tank's empty, so I'm going to put all the V-power in from this one. Right, now I've got the tank full up of fuel. All I'm going to do is use the lift pump here, which is this relay, to fill up the swell pot. Just check for any leaks as well. There you go. So the swell pot's now full. Remember, all this pump here is doing is keeping the swell pot topped up. It's not making any pressure at all, so it's going to have a very easy life now. I'll need to get the fuel rail set to 3 bar, because that's what the base map's been set for. Okay, all right, fuel regulator's plumbed in. I've got some water in. It's time. There's a horrible moment where you've got to test it. And just hope the thing starts up. This is it, guys. Wish me luck. Get the exhaust down here. Hey guys, so the van didn't start, so I've had to strip the loom back again because I had a bit of an issue with the ECU. Rather than just pretend everything was fine and just carry on from turning the key and it magically firing up, things don't always get a plan. I've had to take it all apart again and I've had some help from uh, three awesome guys here, been good as gold. Got to give a massive shout out to Kevin Glover. He's going to be the guy who's going to be mapping this in a couple of weeks time. Uh, also, Chris Roylance from Volks Workshop. He's one of the chaps on the VWDRC and helped me with loads of diagrams of the, um, of the circuitry. And also, Alex Gazard, uh, one of my mates at Badger 5. I put a link to all those guys in the description. I've uh, got to say massive shout out because they've helped me to basically learn how to do an ECU. And I've actually now figured it out. I actually think that I could confidently wire up the ECU myself now. So guys, thank you very much. I've got some loom tape now. I'm dressed up in full ski gear because it's freezing out here. It's about three degrees at the moment. Right, go on in, Mikey. Let's see if she finds it. <laughs> Perfect. Right, and guys, absolutely buzzing off that. I've got my loom tape, so I'm going to get everything taped up now and uh, get the front on, get the coolant in, and get it booked in with Simon down at RK Engineering so we can get the rings bedded in on the dyno in a nice, safe environment to make sure that everything works properly. Just taping up the loom, called in some extra help. No. Are you going to help me with the tape? This one. Has to go there. It does go on there, yeah, that's right. Do you want to hold this bit for me? If you hold that, and then I'll put some tape along here, okay? You hold that. Okay, thank you. That's goes in there. Yeah, that's right. Are you doing it up for me? Oh, thank you. I've got to hold that. Yes. Massive shout out to Alex Gazard at Badger 5, legend. He sent this down for me. It's um, basically a one inch takeoff for the oil filter housing on a 180T. The reason I'm doing more takeoffs uh, from the block is because the engine's going to be breathing quite a bit. The rings are gapped slightly bigger on my build because I'm going to be running nitrous. And if you don't actually gap the rings, you can get ring pinch, which will mean that the rings will pinch the bore. And that's the end of your engine, basically. The top of the uh, piston will come off and smash into the head. This bit's going to go on top here. And then there's going to be a 19mm takeoff here. I know a lot of people like to fit AN fittings, but you know if you do look at an AN fitting, the actual outside diameter versus the internal diameter of the bore really does neck down. And if you do that, you're actually restricting the amount of airflow you're going to get out. There we go, that's all set up now. See the drill bit going in. That bit's now been drilled out, that bit comes off, the taller bit goes on now, so that we can tee in with a 19mm. Right, I'm just using a mini belt sander to notch out this little pipe here for the takeoff. So that's actually gone really well. Look at that. And here it is all finished, ready to be plugged in. There you go, I can see the rain coming in now, so I've got a crack on. Big shout out to Nathan, one of my best mates. 
he pulled the three quarter inch bung out of one of my other cam covers so that we can get this in here. Now if you're wondering why I've gone back to this one when I used to have a threaded one on the top, like an AN fitting, it's because the internal diameter on this is much bigger. The AN fittings, although they might look quite chunky, quite often the inner bore is actually like 50% of what this one is. So I'd much rather go back to something like this and make sure the block can breathe as much as, uh, as, as necessary really. Eventually there will also be an AN fitting going on here, but for the moment, I've already doubled the amount of air that can get out the top of the block just by putting that one on there. Right then, let's take this PCV system out here. So there's the old one with this black plastic bit that goes around here. There you go, you can really see the differences there between the size of the breathers. Bigger holes, flow more air, simple. There you go, that's now in and that is solid. Alright, let's just measure out the cuts. That pipe's going to have to come down under there. So it wants cutting about there really. Okay, one quick little job is to switch this brake servo vac line. A few people mentioned in the comments, thanks guys, uh, that this is quite squishy and they think it might collapse. It is a bit firm, but for the sake of a couple of quid, I thought I'd just uh, switch it over with a much thicker hose. The same internal diameter, but obviously this one is, uh, that's not going to collapse under vacuum. Okay, so the old blue flimsy hose can go. And now with this four ply creation stuff, it's much stronger really really rate these guys uh, Nass and Tan up at Birmingham thanks a lot guys order stuff for them next day it comes the next day without fail and the quality is so good I mean, it's really really strong stuff so yeah I definitely rate this stuff hence why I've done the whole engine bay and it's brilliant hi guys the front's coming off for the final time today we're getting the front on and getting everything finished um, one little thing I want to do for safety you can see here that we've got um, two turbo smart fuel filters one on that side of the rail and one on that side. If I am on track and the front end takes a massive knock, I can really see there being an issue here. If I have a front end crash, I can see it snapping with the fuel filters coming off and then fuel going everywhere in the engine bay. All fuel's got to do is get from there to there. Um, I am going to relocate the fuel filters here, then taking a bracket off of this pipe here, just so that they're not rattling around. Right then, here's the marks on there. Again, okay, let's just turn it off. Right then, fuel filters are off the side of the rails. So now I can put the ORB fittings in. There you go, that's on that side. There you go, so now I think if we do have a front end knock, this is likely to take a whack, and that's gonna take a whack. And because of the way that the bracket's situated, the fuel rail's likely to just bend up with all that surface area, instead of just all that pressure being put on one tiny little alloy fitting. Much happier with that. You know, it may not make any difference. You know, if you ever see this go into a wall at Castle Coombe and catch on fire, you'll know that this was a completely wasted day. So I'm just gonna cut through there now and then get the fitting on so I can work out where the next part's gotta go in the line. Right, there we go. We've got the two filters now in situ. So they're both gonna sit there on a bracket. And now it's just a case of linking them up to the actual rail. We've got this one now coming over the top. There you go, so I've got the fitting on the end now. You've got to cut to this line here so that you can see exactly where it's actually going to sit when it's inside the fitting. Right then, they're all cut and trimmed to the right length. So now what I'm going to do is take them all off and uh, flush them through with some brake and clutch cleaner. So there the filter's relocated. If that does get knocked, it will just bend this up. So now I need to get a bracket knocked up for there. Once this is all in situ in the final spot, I'll get just a flat piece welded onto here on a little triangle and then mount those two there so they're nice and solid. Result. Okay, today's job is to finish off the wiring inside. I've relocated the ECU to the middle there so it's got easier access and it's a bit away from all of the mess over there. And now what I'm going to do is make sure that the coils and the injectors have got their own 12 volt power supply on a fused relay. So I'm just going to figure out where I'm going to put them up here, get them in a nice spot, tidy up the wiring to make sure that everything's nice and neat. Well, you've heard of people burning midnight oil. The old trusty hairdryer on. I'm just finishing off the wiring. There you go, ECU is relocated. So I'm just getting everything tapped in now in the right spot. And my four relays there, there's gonna be another one just on the end in that blank spot. That's gonna be for the nitrous solid state one and then it'll go straight through into the engine bay there. I'm trying to finish this off now, it's freezing. So I'm just trying to keep warm. <laughs> 